Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Great crowd this evening. I'm Jennifer Dribben. I'm the SVP of External Affairs at the National Aquarium, um, which means that I am really fortunate to work with our conservation programs team and our government affairs team and our conservation policy work and our community engagement. Um, it's really a, a wonderful group that works with our external partners, and I really have a great team. So. Um, on behalf of the organization, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a very special installment of the Marjorie Lynn Bank Lecture Series, made possible for more than 20 years because of the generous support of the Bank family. As many of you know, Marjorie was a photojournalist, an environmentalist, a diver, and explorer, and when she passed away in 1994, her family endowed these lectures in her honor. It's been deeply gratifying for the aquarium to play an important part in sharing Marjorie's love of the ocean and her sense of adventure with a community of like-minded people. In addition to recognizing the Bank family for tonight's event, I'd also like to recognize the aquarium family of members and donors who make it possible for the aquarium to connect people with the aquatic world through our exhibits, education programs, conservation initiatives, and so much more. I'd also like to acknowledge the National Aquarium board, staff, and volunteers. We have an amazing team. I am really proud to be a part of it. And it's a team of people who not only work hard, but also care very deeply about the work that they do. Quick housekeeping, if you submitted a question online for the Q&A portion later, we have those. Thank you for sending them in. If you didn't, no worries. We handed out some index cards, um, so feel free to jot down a question for our speakers, and we'll collect them at the beginning of the Q&A portion. This series focuses on change makers, individuals who have devoted themselves to creating positive change, be it to address climate change and promote resiliency, improve ocean and human health, or build needed diversity in the conservation space. Currently, voices of color are underrepresented in the conservation movement. We believe it's important to provide the space for a dedicated conversation about diversity and conservation and how to achieve a future where there is equitable representation and equitable access. And it's important to note that that responsibility does not lie solely with people of color. It's the responsibility of all of us to contribute to that work. This is our second year hosting Nature for All. With the support of community partners, we're honored to host this evening focused on increasing diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice throughout the world and specifically in the conservation field. I wanna thank our community partners that are joining us this evening. Black Girls Dive, Building Steps, Maryland Environmental Health Network, National Wildlife Federation and Choose Clean Water Coalition, Parks and People Foundation, Patterson Park Audubon Center, Maryland Department of Natural Resources SME Park A Program, and Children in Nature Network. This year, we are thrilled to have a panel of conservation leaders to reflect on progress and challenges. And to moderate this important conversation, I'm going to welcome Curtis Bennett, one of our own. Curtis not only leads the National Aquarium's transformational conservation community engagement initiatives, which include work in Brooklyn and Curtis Bay, Masonville Cove, historic Jonestown, and other areas of the city, but is also responsible for the integration of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in our external programs, and really changing our internal culture. Curtis is sparking challenging conversations and working with others to lead the aquarium on what we know will be a critical, critically important journey. I look forward to learning through this evening's discussion, and without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Curtis Bennett. Thank you. Good evening. Um, and first and foremost, I just wanna say thank you all for taking the time, um, whether that's our community partners, our panelists, our event planning staff, and anyone in attendance this evening for taking the time to be here tonight to talk. When it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, my reflections usually revolve around values and a learning journey. And it's one that we must take personally, within ourselves, personally and organizationally, in terms of how we engage our communities, and lastly, within our respective industries. 
I firmly believe that diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice are values. And as such, it's important to make the time and space to regularly have these conversations. Because in doing so, we foster the continued development of those values within our personal lives and within our respective organizations. As I look around this evening, I'm excited to say that I see an inspired community of practice comprised of individuals that will not only support and guide each other through the journey, but will also hold each other accountable, empowering each other to ultimately learn and apply what is learned in our personal and professional lives. This evening's conversation represents one part of our journey. And so during the entirety of the event, I wanna challenge you all to think about the next steps. What is that next thing that you will do as part of your journey in terms of integrating diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice? What is your personal commitment that you make to yourself for this very critical work? And lastly, how will you continue to inspire and empower others to do the same? Now you may be asking yourself, why is the National Aquarium convening these conversations? As Jen pointed out earlier, I'm really excited to say that as an organization, we're in the process of charting our own journey into diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Throughout many of our current community engagement efforts in both South and East Baltimore, conservation projects, education programs, and access events, we strive to consistently apply a diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice lens. But as an organization, we understand that we need to and can do better. And it is our hope that this upcoming journey will create the consistent space, time, and opportunity for this growth. As part of my new role at the National Aquarium, I'm both honored and excited to be part of the core team leading the organization's diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice journey. And it's a journey that will require all of us, from an engagement and commitment from all staff and volunteers in the organization to ultimately move these efforts forward. Similarly, it will take all of us in the room and more learning, working, and growing together to achieve the outcomes for the conservation field. As we move forward with this evening's program, in order to achieve our desired outcomes of collective learning and growth, it's important that we lay the foundation and set expectations for this shared space. Number one, it's really important for us to listen actively and to understand, respecting others when they are talking. Reserve the right to change your mind. Expect discomfort, non-closure, and imperfection from yourself and others throughout this journey. Be mindful of body language, those nonverbal signs. Speak from your own experience. Use I statements. Treat feedback as a gift. And lastly, it's important to take what's learned here and take it with you. And not only that, apply it, share it, because that's how we achieve that collective growth in our respective fields, in our communities. And with that, I would like to take the time to introduce our featured speakers and panelists, who will each speak for approximately 20 minutes about their own personal journeys and professional experiences. starting with Juan Martinez. A proud product of South Central Los Angeles, Juan D. Martinez is the Children and Nature Network's Director of Leadership Development in the Natural Leaders Network. He is also a National Geographic Explorer and a TED speaker. At an early age, his passion to empower youth individuals led him to direct the Sierra Club's first environmental justice, Youth Leadership Academy in Los Angeles. 
and his interesting journey continued from there. Juan represented the North Face as an ambassador for outdoor engagement, and his adventures include reaching the summit of the Grand Teton in 2010 with famed mountain climber Conrad Anker. From there, Martinez was named a National Geographic Emerging Explorer and travels across the US speaking and encouraging other young people to explore the outdoors. In 2014, the National Science Teachers Association Multicultural and Equity Committee honored Juan for his work as a global explorer. A few years ago, Juan was invited to be the Murray Center Explorer in residence in Grand Teton National Park, Wyoming. Following his residence experience, he was elected to the Murray Center's Board of Directors. During his time at the Murray Center, he met and married Vanessa Torres. His compelling journey and their wedding was filmed for the documentary feature, Love in the Tetons, which premiered at the Telluride Film Festival and was a finalist in the 2015 Banff Film Festival. Juan is on the Wilderness Society's Government Council, elected in 2015, and in 2012, he was elected to the Sierra Club Foundation Board, their youngest member ever. An excellent and convincing speaker, Juan participated in the first TED Youth National Conference in New York and TEDx in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Crediting his experience of growing up in South Central LA with a deep understanding of the need to connect children, families, culture, and communities with the natural world. Juan has made a commitment to help empower the next generation of conservation and outdoor recreation leaders. Juan's most recent contribution to furthering his mission is joining the ambassador program of Yvonne Chernard, 1% of the For the Planet, an alliance of businesses financially committed to creating a healthy planet. Through this Children and Nature Network, Natural Leaders Network, Juan is working with strategic partners and dedicates his energy on grassroots campaigns to empower, explore, and create positive change. With that, Juan Martinez. Buenas tardes. Afternoon. Uh, evening. Where you? Uh, Curtis, thank you. I, I don't think um, many people read the whole bio. And I am sh sitting up here uh, really being um, bashful. So um, we'll talk a little bit about all those titles here in a sec. But I want to start off by thanking each and every single one of you to begin with. You had a choice in your life, and I really believe in choice and time and where you spend and how you invest that time. And so at some point, you could have decided to be at home and watch Jeopardy or uh, join us tonight. So thank you for investing your time with us and making this space what it is today. The other part I want to uh, start off with is thanking the and being in gratitude to the staff and the team here at the National Aquarium. Thank you for the invitation and for hosting this space. It means a lot. Um, and I, one of the things that I will invite all of you as you start to host events or do um, uh, host any kind of community gathering is to really acknowledge the first stewards and heroes of conservation and, and stewards of the land, and that's the native people of your own community. Uh, and so here in the Baltimore area, th that's the Lumbi, the Piscataue, and the Cherokee tribe people of this uh, region. And so uh, recognizing that theirs is not a history of the past, but it is a history of resilience in their culture and their communities and their people continue today. And so I would invite you to reach out to those communities as well. So like, uh, uh, you know, 20 minutes uh, to have a conversation and, and start, uh, you know, thinking about some of the Q&As here. Um, I invite each and every one of you to th think about your own personal narrative. What does it mean? What brought you to this room today? Uh, at some point, you made a left or you made a right, and it led you to this room today. And so one of the most beautiful things about life is, is 
uh, our stories. And so we'll start with my story, then we'll go into some of the um, some of what I've been able to do with that and, and what we can do together uh, moving forward. So my story starts in South Central LA. When people see this picture, they think of a war zone. These are the LA riots um, after Rodney King uh, and the police officers that, that um, assaulted him were acquitted. Um, my entire community went up in fire. And I was six years old and I remember uh, looking out the window and seeing my community literally burn to the ground. Up at the top right corner is, is our apartment building and that entire block burnt down. That was our main source of food and, and um, I remember those hour, two hour but long bus rides to, to get our basic necessities, milk, water, food, anything that we needed during those couple of weeks was, was left. And while my upbringing was, was a bit rough, um, there were always opportunities, uh, there, there was always a light, and the light was my family. And my dad and mom, uh, after us moving around South Central a lot, uh, sleeping on couches, uh, taking 24-hour bus rides because at times we were homeless and having to end up in a homeless shelter. Um, the one thing that they brought with them always was the seeds from uh, our home country, and that was Oaxaca and Puebla out of Mexico. And once we finally found our home, they broke through concrete and planted those seeds and in that garden for us, it was not about urban gardening. It was not about um, a hobby. For us, it was survival. For us, it meant food independence to be able to grow our own jalapenos, to grow our own beans, our own corn, and to have that when times got rough. And so they passed on, un unknowingly to me, they passed on this, this tradition and this culture of stewardship of the land. I went to Dorsey High School. So Dorsey High School might not sound as familiar as Crenshaw High School. Crenshaw High School um, is our high school rival for Dorsey. But it goes beyond traditional rivalry. It's the birthplace of the Bloods and the Cribs. And so I, at the age of 13 had stared down the gun of a barrel one too many times. Many of those times by other hands and one of those times by my own hand inflicted by the trauma that I was seeing out there and the society consistently telling me that I did not matter. That my life could be gone in a flash and nothing in this world would change. Something happens to you when your first day of school, they ask you to look to your left and look to your right because those individuals will likely not be at graduation. That was the attitude that my school had. And so I ended up uh, going through a gang intervention program uh, that used uh, urban agriculture as an intervention method to do that. And that was the only thing that I could do right. That was the only thing that I could felt I could do right was to plant these jalapenos that my mom had taught me how to do, and I was being such a messed up kid at that point that I felt like I could do one thing right, and that was these jalapenos. At the end of the semester, I got an opportunity to apply for a scholarship, and that was the high school field ecology program based out of the Teton Science School. And that was the first time that anybody had ever put something in front of me and said, you matter enough, that I believe in you enough, to even put your name on this paper. And so for me, at that point, having never left more than a 10-mile radius outside of LA, it became a point of exploration. And for me, it wasn't, I fell in love with the stars, that I could see stars for the first time in my life that I could see a free-flowing river, 
that I could see aspen trees um, without having any concrete nearby. I didn't know how to react to quiet because I could not fall asleep without the sirens or the helicopters overhead. That was my nighttime noise. And I knew I was home if I could hear that, but in, in the middle of the mountains, I could not fall asleep. But something happened out there. Something happened where I fell in love with the outdoors. I fell in love with the, um, with the mountains and the rivers. And I figured out that there was enough heart and soul in these mountains and these rivers and enough of my heart and soul in the middle of, Jack, uh, of South Central LA to figure out how to keep connecting those two dots. And that's what I've been dedicating my life um, since then, since the age since the age of 15, I'm 34 now, so that's uh, 14, uh, no, that's 18 years later uh, that I've been working on this. And I kept going back, and I kept uh, uh, running into these amazing uh, expeditions, so getting to study the great American bison, uh, uh, migratory patterns to do the great, greater Ye Yellowstone um, territory, getting published on the Smithsonian, working with the mayor of LA to plant a million trees and launch that campaign in LA, um, going on high school, uh, pulling together high schools throughout the LA County and getting on a boat to go off the coast of Catalina on the Captain Jack um, and go on two man submersible um, submarines to, to track and tag great white sharks off the, off the LA coast. Uh, all of these things led, led to ex expeditions across the US uh, to collect data and work with scientists to go up to mountaintops. Uh, this is the, 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 the ridge at Grand Teton through the Exum route. Um, and we're collecting glacier samples as we're going up. Um, and we're gonna skip these videos. Um, and so in 2005, uh, Richard Lou wrote a book called Last Child in the Woods. Just a curiosity, how many of you have read that book? All right. Uh, so Last Child in the Woods pull, put a theory together and, and put it out to, to the world. And in that theory, Rich uh, started, uh, coined the phrase called nature deficit disorder. And the theory goes that we know now um, that as we disconnect with nature, we start to see higher obesity rates. Uh, we start to see the farm, pharmaceutical rates go down for, um, for antidepressants. Uh, we now know that kindergartens are starting to be prescribed antidepressants, uh, going as low as that. We know that 90% of uh, a teenager's time between uh, 11 and 15 is spent indoors, uh, and about 40 to 45 hours of that is spent connected to a screen in some way, shape, or form. And so if you think about that, 40 to 45 hours, that's a full-time job with no benefits, by the way. Um, but that's, that's what we know through the New Nature Movement. Um, and, and what Rich and I connected on as, as I was doing my work. Along the way, we've started to do some pretty, um, pretty invigorating work through the Natural Leaders Network. And a lot of my portfolio now, now uh, within the Children and Nature Network deals with looking at equity through the movement. Um, and so that question that the aquarium is asking itself is one of the questions that we're asking ourselves as well. At what point do we start to acknowledge the voices that are in the room, but more than that, acknowledge the voices that are not in the room? And what are the gaps and resources that make it so that they are not either included, feel included, or that there's a community and an environment that allows for that to happen? And so oftentimes you will hear the question, well, we put a flyer together. Well, you, you, you will hear a statement, we put a flyer together, we put it out everywhere, and they didn't show up. We built this great park, but nobody uses it. 
And the questions around that aren't just as simple as building and putting out information, but really asking ourselves the hard questions of our own history. How the national park system was built on an institutionalized racist system. It's an amazing idea, but it is also a hard truth to acknowledge there. that having just celebrated the National Park's 100 year anniversary in 2016, for about 50 or 70 of those years, black and brown people were not allowed to partake in that conservation history. And so it's not as simple as it, it is there. It is not as simple as the information is available. It is not as simple as we welcome everybody. It is more in depth, and I think that's the courageous part of this room, of the aquarium, of hosting these kind of conversations across the country to ask ourselves those hard questions, to dive into our own history, and to recognize that there is privilege and a racial history there that cannot be sugarcoated. And oftentimes, I think that the conservation movement at large tries really hard to sugarcoat that ugly history. And what I've come to learn throughout our, my own journey of becoming, of connecting with this conservation movement is one that I love it. One that I have never felt as welcomed in an environment as I do when I'm in the outdoors in nature because I feel like the sun doesn't look at my skin color, the river doesn't care what my bank account is, and the mosquitoes certainly don't care who you are. <laughs> and so it stands to question that we can use, my theory is that we can really uh, use our natural environment as an equal platform to bring communities together to acknowledge the hard truths and to lean in courageously to explore those truths together and put a path forward. So I do that throughout the country um, through our Natural Leaders Network, through our Fresh Tracks program. Uh, one of the, mo the uh, most recent programs that I've worked with is Fresh Tracks. Uh, it is a program run out of the Center for Native American Youth out of the Aspen Institute in partnership with the Natural Leaders Network. And it stems to this question when uh, I, I attended a talk by a Wichita elder of the Arctic, um, Arctic community in Alaska and they are fighting for their right to uh, hold on to sovereignty and, uh, uh, and the caribou herd. Um, and my question was, well, what would it take for my community in Compton to be connected to this? And my answer to that was working with the young leaders. And so we started off by taking them to Yosemite National Park, young leaders from Arctic Circle in all over Alaska, um, and young leaders from Compton. That was Yosemite uh, National Park, uh, introducing them to, to those kind of uh, spaces. This is the Arctic Circle, um, gateway to the Arctic in, in Alaska. And so these are young leaders from Compton and LA hosting each other in their own communities and acknowledging what it all means at the end of the day. And to me, it boils down to uh, two key things. And that one of them is family. And what I've come to learn throughout these years is that family is relative. Family to me is defined not only by blood and those who I grew up with, but it is defined by those who stand in action with me. And so that is my family. And the second part is love. And I know sometimes that sounds corny, and believe me, I was there too. But when you start to analyze the f nature of love, that love is this sense of ownership, of pride, of reaffirmation that you deserve to be here, that we all in this room deserve to be here 
and we don't often hear it enough, that I am proud of you for taking the step forward to be in this room, that I see you, that I don't know your entire history, but know that I am dedicated to moving forward with you. And for that, I love you. Because the healing of trauma starts when we start to acknowledge each other, when we start to move past these motions of looking back, acknowledging what is in front of us and building a, the solutions that we want to see for our communities, for our families, and for our future. That's what the generation of leaders looks like. As, as uh, Curtis mentioned, my, um, my wife and I, um, I lucked out. The only, you know, I used to be bald headed and the typical South Central um, a stereotype of, of what, it, what you would imagine somebody to look like. If I look, look somewhat presentable today, it is because of her. <laughs> um, but she's also a park ranger. And so, so we have these kind of conversations all the time. She, uh, and she's, she's the only reason I would ever move to Springfield, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> I see some hands up. Uh, she is now the Deputy Director of Interpretation for the Abraham Lincoln Home um, there. The first Latina to ever hold that office and curating a presidential legacy that looks not only at the beauty of, of what, the, uh, what President Lincoln did, but also the shadow and the darkness of what came with his presidency. And the other part that she is dedicated to working with there is that after, um, a couple years after, after his, assassination, his assassination on the anniversary of his birthday, um, there was a lynching in Springfield, Illinois three lynchings that happened in, during the race riots. Those were also the, the, the catalyst for the NAACP. So there's history in that space that both needs to be told, whether it's pretty ugly or anywhere in between, but it needs to be told so that we can learn those lessons. And finally, I'll leave you with this quote which has followed me from the very beginning of my journey, and it's by, United Farm Worker co-founder Cesar Chavez along. And it goes with, um, once social change begins, it cannot be reversed. You cannot uneducate the person who has learned to read. You cannot oppress the people who have, who have seen the future. Uh, Thank you. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to the rest of the program. So thank you. Um, thank you so much again, Juan, for your remarks this evening. Um, they were incredibly inspiring, and um, thank you for taking the time to be here this evening. Next, I would like to introduce um, Tamara Tolzo Laughlin. Tamara is a native New Yorker, an environmentalist focused on equity, access, and community. She develops capacity building programs and creates multimedia campaigns to dismantle privilege and increase opportunities for vulnerable populations to access healthy air, clean energy, and a toxic-free economy at the local, regional, and national level. Tamara is the executive director of the Maryland Environmental Health Network, based in Baltimore, Maryland. Maryland Environmental Health Network levels the playing field for vulnerable populations in service to its mission to promote the elimination of exposures to environmental threats to improve human health. Tamara cast a wide net in service to the environmental community. Among other activities, she is a co-chair of the DC chapter of Eco Women. D 
DC Eco Women is a community of approximately 6,000 professional women who inspire each other to create a healthy and equitable society. During her tenure on the executive board, she has held several positions, including vice president of professional development, where she produced the organization's signature sal salon and monthly educational forum, Eco Hour. Tamar is the vice chair of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, Air and Climate Public Advisory Committee, where she advocates for meaningful engagement and responsive public resources. She is the director of the Board of Directors for Women's Voices for the Earth, a mighty organization based in Missoula, Montana, where she supports science-based advocacy that gives voice to women fighting to protect their health from toxic chemicals. She is also the co-chair of the Green Leadership Trust. Tamar has over 15 years of cross-sector environmental experience. Prior to moving to the nonprofit work, she has held several positions in state and local government, including Energy Communications Manager at the Maryland Energy Administration in Annapolis, and a legislative fellowship at the District Department of Energy and Environment, among others. Prior to relocating to the DC metro area, Tamara was the senior law clerk to the Honorable Douglas A. Brady and the senior sitting judge, Hort, Judge Julio A. Brady at the Supreme Court of the US Virgin Islands on St. Croix. Tamara developed her aptitude for environmental injustice issues through internships with the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Center on Race, Poverty and Environment, Natural Resources Defense Council, and employment with the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. To date, the defining characteristic of Tamara's career has been a commitment to public service with specific attention to environmentally focused community and government relations. Tamara is a strategic thinker committed to environmental advocacy in support of poor and chronically underserved she has worked relentlessly to promote equity in environmental protection and enforcement with particular attention to community capacity, mobilization, access to opportunity, and reduction of health disparities. Her hobbies include travel, yoga, slowly reading books about energy, politics, and neuroscience, and writing about civil society. And with that, I'd like to introduce Tamara Tolles O'Loughlin. That was exhausting. Um, every time I listen to that, I need a nap. I need a, like, I feel it come over me and I am, realize that that's why I'm exhausted. Um, I'm super excited to be here tonight because I get to be a few minutes from where I live, which is exciting for me to be able to work not far from where I live and talk to people who are a part of my community about the things that I do invisibly as one of many people. I see some faces of folks that are like family to me in this room. Why? Because we run into each other in the same hallway in the middle of a panic trying to figure out how to make everything work and to do it silently. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's a giant picture of my head and uh, some ways that you can contact me after this. Uh, if you put urgent in the headline, I'll actually reply to you, so pro tip. Um, <laughs> I'm also gonna tell you that what you're about to see is not the uh, is not what happens when anything magical, special, or um, uh, unusual happens. I am the result of what communities make when they are allowed to raise their children. When people put the love they have in their hearts into the people that they make, and they're able to raise them on their own terms. So, so everything you're about to see comes from community. Uh, my mom is and was uh, one of the most mystical human beings I've ever seen. She's a um, spiritual guide on the side of being an environmentalist for over 30 some years. And my father was a community police officer who worked in Bed-Stuy well before it was Bushwick. So if you know anything about gentrification and um, what it means to, to have lived, it, my brother lives in a building that was sold to the owner for a dollar because it was full of crackheads in the 80s. And now, if you could find a dollar, you still couldn't, you can buy anything within five miles of that same place. So the world is turning. We are all a part of a big community. And what I learned from the two of them is that that's where we do our best work. 
So everything good that I have goes back into community and you are now a part of that discussion. So I appreciate your time and energy. So this is everything you could know about me in one slide deck. These are the people I love, the ways that I love, the frameworks that I use to approach how I deal with community, and the people that I know. So that first grouping signifies just the ways that I try to make my way through the world. Climate and energy work is difficult. It involves talking about lots of things we have chosen not to see, and so I use humor and community, equity, creativity. All these are the tools that help me get through. It's a part of my personal sustainability plan, is to make sure that I am laughing, because if I'm not doing anything else, I'm just at work. <laughs> so the guy in that photo is my husband, and he represents one of the many things that I've been able to do right, despite uh, all the ways I've tried to get it wrong. And and what's important to that about it is because we met in the US Virgin Islands, we clerked for the same judge, and he is the embodiment of my, one of my greatest principles is that you don't have a work life, you only have one life. So if you're not doing some of it in a way that's enjoyable to you, you're wasting it. Um, the spheres are just lots of places where I know folks and folks know me by my first and last name. So there are places where I can call and ask someone for a favor or to help me understand something, or to teach me something like an eight-year-old so that I can stand up here and talk to you like I've known it forever. So there are just, these are, these are the things that we do in community to help each other survive. The next two slides that you're about to see are organizations that I do some work with. The letters in green, um, these, each of these blocks are the mission statements of these organizations. The letters in green are the things that I do to wrap my life around those missions so that I can do that work and feel like I'm not always at work. So for the Green Leadership Trust, Eco Women, Women's Voices for the Earth, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, trust me, it takes a lot of heart to try to put some love into the Council of Governments and the <laughs> Metropolitan Planning Organization, <laughs> but I do it monthly, weekly, sometimes daily. Um, and, and different parts of um, the Climate Commission, which just meets over here in, Monka, in the old Montgomery Ward building. There are folks trying to figure out how to brainstorm around climate change and be in a bureaucracy at the same time. It takes a lot of love and community to get up every morning and try to do, get that work done. Happy to talk to anyone about that if you'd like to. But pop quiz, let's do something fun. Woo. Awesome. Well. Well, given that there's only one microphone, it's entirely possible that you'll know the answer. Um, which of the following things that you're about to see can be considered an environmental health issue? Oh, man. You sure? How many of you have seen me give this talk before? Because <laughs> you're right. It is all of the above. Every single one of these things creates space for an environmental health intervention, which means this work is even more exhausting because everything's your business. I'm gonna dig in a little bit when I want it into what I mean when I say these things and the kinds of relationships that I'm looking for and the communities that we create in this space over the course of our time together. So this is where I spend most of my time at the Maryland Environmental Health Network. It's how we work, it's what we do. This is our mission statement in orange. And one of the best things that you could take away from this is that we consistently ask the annoying question of who is missing from this discussion? No matter what room I'm in, that's really what I wanna know is we can't be doing our job if blank is missing. We couldn't possibly be talking about zoning if no one who lives here is in the space. We couldn't possibly be talking about air quality issues if we don't talk to the people who trucks run through this community and have them talk to the people who live here. So, Consistently trying to figure out who's missing and constantly filling in that puzzle piece means we make a lot of friends over a long time. These are our uh, guiding principles and the way that we do our work. So our mission statement is to promote the elimination of environmental threats to human health. Um, our vision just means your home, your education, your status or lack thereof should not be a determinant of your health. You have the right to be healthy. So. One of the things we do in working that out is we create a series of programs and policies and campaigns to remind people that just because we have built a system that ignores humanity and health doesn't mean we don't need both of those things to be successful. So we spend a lot of time um, describing it to people who build things, uh, social engineers, 
um, planners, folks who are, are the heads of government bodies and legislators and advocates. We talk a lot about how most of what we've built in the infrastructure space is kind of like going home from a really great party and you have tons of photos and you're not in any of them. And you're like, well, how'd that happen? I was having such a good time. I took so many photos of people. This is well before selfie, the selfie time. But when you would go home and you'd, you'd finally develop that, that thing of photos from a party and you're like, oh, that's Jan and Sarah and Billy and Lakeisha and all these people, and I'm not in any of these. What happened? I was having such a good time, I didn't pose for any photos. So if you think about it that way, that's what we've done in transportation. Uh, that's what we've done in the energy space. That's what we've done around human. Anything that isn't explicitly called human health was built without the consideration of human health. And so looking at all of that stuff in modern time and trying to fit these questions back into the work is a full-time job. So these are our priority areas. There are three buckets. So there are three lanes that we choose to be in in order to help people focus on the central points. So climate and energy, vulnerable population health, and toxics and chemical exposures. It's a lot of making people see things we've learned not to see. And it's actually great work if you're interested. So these are the coalitions that we do it in because again, everything I know happens in community. So these are the statewide coalitions and these are some of the Baltimore groups where we do this work with tons of partners who lend their capacity and their energy and their skill set and their shared assets in order for us to be able to work together. And there are more. There are folks who didn't make it to this slide whose work is almost always emerging and churning. And so um, these are just some of the ways we get stuff done in this, as a very small group. If you've ever been to an environmental health lecture and seen these two pictures, uh, raise your hand. Wow, you guys are fresh meat. That's nice. Um, so part of why these slides are at every American Public Health Association or Maryland Public Health Association meeting is because they're actually really good descriptors of environmental health and how it touches every part of your life. I think of it as you invite me to your house and I can ruin your dinner before it even gets served because so many parts of what, are we, what we're doing, where we go, where we get our food, how people treat you help to determine your health. And so it really, I can just Debbie Downer, just don't invite me after the dessert and you'll have a great night. But ultimately, you know, inadequate water, air pollution, light pollution, community noise, radiation, occupational risk, almost everything about our lives is designed to either help or hurt us. And for communities who have not been invited into that conversation, they could be paying for this kind of risk. So what does that look like? Here's a visual because as a person who's a visual learner, I want to make sure we talk about this work in more than one way. The grids help people, the words help others. So if the big picture is that regional health impacts are created by things that happen individually, there are interventions happening in your kitchen, in your bathroom, on your way to work, when you interact with people, and when you go home at night, all of which are real determinants of your health and happiness. So. If human health is impacted by the policies, what are we getting at? These are the kinds of questions that show up when you start to poke at infrastructure as if it isn't, what it, is, it could be more than what it currently is. You have to ask questions like, does energy that's produced in Maryland, should, should the energy that goes out of Maryland benefit people who live in Maryland? Should we invest in uh, offshore wind because the side effect of doing a thing that could be hard and expensive now could be people having better air quality? The World, the World Health Organization says that the top of the top 10 things that can kill you, six of them are air quality and five of them are in your house. So like, what does it mean to confront these questions of where is health showing up, where is health absent, and what is the difference between communities who experience it and those who don't? Why do we do this? because it's already happened, it's gonna keep happening, especially if we don't talk about it. This is the part that gets a lot less warm and fuzzy. So let's talk, part of why we have to talk about the past is because we're doomed to repeat it if we don't discuss it. So what's the history in the context of environment and health? Juan touched on it, a lot of whiteness. And that whiteness doesn't come without a cost. Whiteness is a legal terminology among other things, that creates space for privilege and lack of privilege, but in a specifically in the context of conservation and environment, it creates images of who deserves to enjoy green space, who is welcome into that green space, who's safe in that green space, and what it means to try to preserve it in a context where America and the global south are becoming really close together. 
we're one we're one census away from not being able to say the word minority without the awful irony that always accompanied it. What are we doing as people who care about natural spaces and people being in them and celebrating anniversaries and protecting the ecos the ecosystem in our biosphere if we do not bring up the false premises that have sustained what we currently have? So we have to talk about it because you can't welcome people into a space they've been told to be out of if you don't discuss that that's where it's happening. That's why it's happening. So this next slide, literally, you could put any man's photo into there. Just like look up some dude from 1800 whatever. I did not do that because I have principles. But what I'm saying is that you could, you could essentially grab a photo of any guy whose name sounds like two presidents and this would, and this would be his exact same bio. He really did love trees, he sure did hate black people. You know, so I mean, I, I mean, and you laugh, but it's true. It's one of those things that like the facts run together because of what we think of as wealth and how we define it. But it would be, it's one thing to focus on, you know, random man, presidential name, racist, xenophobic, terrible human, right? But the important part is actually happening on this side of the slide. Because while this person with lots of money who could donate a lot to make people experience a thing that they too have found beautiful after many horrible things have happened, where the rubber meets the road are these regulations and statutes and laws where we move, where we move money and dollars and resources and people every day. We create commerce streams and make people wealthy. wealthy. We invent divestment strategies around policies where we tell people they can and can't be places. So as much as we focus on the identity politics, we should be paying attention to what we've built. Here are some stats. The reason they're here is because all of that led to this. I did a comparison of the 2017 version of these numbers, which came from Green 2.0's diversity card. They did a transparency card and a diversity card that covers um, the 40 top non-NGOs and foundations to look at their makeup, the people who are staffed there, the people who become senior folks, and whether or not they ever have people who come into the work stay into it long enough to get close to the levers of power. And when I was changing the numbers from 2017 to 2018, there wasn't a difference of more than two degrees. So even in a world where we spend a lot more time thinking about it, not talking about the past means we cannot do the work that needs to be done today. So if these numbers upset you, we have to start talking about what we've already done. So what's missing from this story? You guys, because I have a mic and you don't, which is like a thing. Um, let's talk about the hard stuff, environmental justice. I'm gonna show a slide that gives a breakdown of the timeline that is the sort of common nomenclature of how we came to the term environmental justice. But what I'm gonna do, in, and while I talk about it, is give you a piece of wisdom that I got from a really smart woman, Vernice Miller Travis, um, who said that environmental justice is like a prism that you put onto other systems and it makes them work better or worse. So part of why it's really difficult to clamp down on how we could be doing justice work, we'll get to that later, is that it, it literally is a prism that shows you whether another system is working. So these are the dates and these are the things that happen. Most importantly, the National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit was a place where we have spawned a lot of folks who are still around who can talk to you about what it means to move from being a victim of a thing to trying to figure out how you solve it and developing a community around doing it. Here are some other dates that are really good and some things that keep us in the space that we are currently existing in. We have an executive order as tenuous as that sort of thing can be. Uh, there are a lot of things going on to make it so that we still have that umbrella even when the federal government itself isn't work the way it used to. Um, there are groups that are organizing around this work, principles that keep us in check in the conversation and the biggest thing to ever happen to legislation, the precautionary principle. Which, which is more likely to get you shot in Annapolis than talking about recycling in Baltimore, right? Because it's dangerous to say that we don't know what's going to happen to people, so we shouldn't do it. We're not sure what the answers are, so perhaps we should cut back. That is a danger. It, it, cre it sounds like extinction level crisis for development if we have designed development to be something that has to be pit against communities. So. This is a really great thing to have in your back pocket. I enjoy uh, upsetting people consistently by mentioning it in spaces that aren't as warm and welcoming as this. 
This slide is how the Maryland Environmental Health Network operationalizes environmental justice, because it isn't just about understanding the principle itself, but figuring out how it fits into your system. Curtis talked just about that. You can be a Jedi all day long. You can care about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion all day long. But until you figure out how to apply it to a system that exists, it's just words. And they're upsetting words to people who hear you but aren't seeing you do it. So this is one of the things that we have formed to figure out how we actually work in environmental justice when, as the later slide will tell you, people do justice work and organizations do equity work. The two do not meet without a lot of work and people do not do equity work, institutions do it. So happy to talk about that more in the Q&A if people want to tease that out. But part of our operational framework is that we apply questions about equity, access, and justice to every program that we build, every campaign that we're a part of, every coalition that we participate in, who's in the conversation, who's less out of the conversation, what does it do to erase the historical um, stains that have come from people living in a space where they're not acknowledged. Free advice, I also like the photo. This is what I mentioned earlier, that we have to come to a, to a place where we think about the idea that while we want to do justice work, as entities and organizations and corporations, that is difficult because justice work is done by people. So I have about one minute to go through a couple of slides. This is our working definition on equity. Happy to talk about how we've operationalized it because we work here in Baltimore and everywhere else across the state. We work in places where people are surprised to see me. And when I show up in my Prius, they ask, how did you find this community? mostly because I recognize that we are experiencing the same things and it would be inequitable to act as if the things we're worried about only act on the places that I'm comfortable going. So there's a couple pieces that I'm not gonna go into in depth, but this is just a question that I think everybody should think about as we start to think about what happens in the clean energy space, in the land use space, in the space making space, we have to recognize that none of these things are virtuous by nature. They can be destructive because we don't think about the how. They can be horrifying because we don't invite the right who. And we can fail to do the work if we don't recognize that just doing a good thing isn't good in a vacuum. There's much more to say here, but I'm afraid that Curtis will stop being nice if I don't uh, shuffle along. So I will, I'm happy to discuss our thoughts on equity, our thoughts on justice, on the way the Maryland Environmental Health Network works in this space as a good partner, and how we would love to bring you into that work. And how we got to some of the assumptions that we've made, testing them a lot on community members who have been very honest about what works and doesn't work for them in the, in the nonprofit organizational space, and what it means to try to connect with government actors when you have had terrible experiences with them, and what it means to be a liaison for those things. So. There's just a lot to discuss in this space, and I'm just really excited that the aquarium has availed itself as an ally in that discussion. I appreciate every one of you and look forward to having a conversation about these things and more shortly. So the first question I wanna open the floor with this evening is um, first starting off from both of the work that you both do, both in the environmental justice space and in the environmental education, natural resource um, management space. Um, we know in the conservation field, we also have to do much better of integration of the work moving forward to achieve those holistic outcomes. So from both of your perspectives, um, where do you see opportunity and or need of this collaboration and better integration across spaces? So I'm, I'm having like, a, um, I'm having a reawakening, and I think uh, one of the quotes that, that I saw recently around this is, there is no single issue individual. There is no single issue community. There is no single issue solution. And so it's really about exploring those intersection, that intersectionality of where does health and environmental justice meet, where does violence prevention and conservation meet, where does racism and gender, um, gender balance meet? Um, where, where do all these, uh, all these issues meet? And really exploring those intersectionalities so that we can start to work together and, and recognize that when you show up into this room, 
you're not just carrying the entire conservation movement on your shoulders. You are carrying your community with you, your history, your family, your community, whatever, and the issues that are uh, that that are that you are being impacted by. Um, one of one of the things that we do with Fresh Tracks, and and one of the reasons why I'm so excited is because for the first time, uh, we are seeing a Native American uh, leadership institute take the uh, Take the the reins uh, on a program that's gonna, that's impacting tribal, urban, and rural youth leaders across the country, but being led by a Native American philosophy and, and lens. And so that for me is really impactful because it offers up this opportunity to talk about what it means to do suicide prevention program and domestic abuse um, recognition and and safety programs and all uh, while also addressing how we move forward to create a sustainable and, and mindful community that, that will advocate for the caribou preservation of the porcupine in, in Arctic Circle, that will advocate for um, more wilderness space in, in Boston, outside of Boston um, in the Maine woods. And, but that ultimately comes down to why people care about each other. And so one of the things that I always like to say is, you know, for every reason that I love a tree, I love, I, I, I look to my neighbor more than I would to that tree. And so how can I support my neighbor and how can we come together to, to, to preserve and protect the spaces that matter to all of us? So. Wow. Um, I, uh, I think my greatest sense of satisfaction comes from uh, inside of the Maryland work where we're connecting urban and rural communities. They have a lot of the same problems caused by industry X or lack of attention or not being seen as um, they get left behind by the times and by people who have ascribed a specific set of characteristics to that community. And um, one of my favorite moments is watching an elderly man from um, a rural part of the state speak in environmental justice parlance it's very confusing to a politician because they're just like, well, those aren't your words. You can't describe your problem in that way. You can't suggest that you have a space in this work and that you should be consulted before bad things happen to you. You're supposed to be angry at your neighbor. And so it's really satisfying to find those spaces where um, I can talk to someone whose basement is flooding in Baltimore and say, do you know what's causing that? And they give us a couple of answers and we sort of tease back until we talk about climate change. And then we say, here's your neighbor in Talbot who hasn't had a baseball field after five o'clock in 10 years for the same reason. You should probably talk about it. Or are you upset that we don't have mass transit in Baltimore in such a vibrant city? You should talk to your neighbor who doesn't want that highway to show up in their backyard and put the game that runs through their field into their highway because you guys actually have the same problem. And so I do think in a different way we're taking back some of the narrative about who can feel um, entitled to an answer and connecting groups of people who would otherwise be pit against one another in a way that's deeply satisfying for me. Thank you. Um, Tamara, during your presentation, you mentioned the Green 2.0 report. And in terms of both creating opportunities and pathways for people of color in the conservation space, um, but also being able to broaden and ult ultimately deepen our transformational engagement within um, communities. So I wanted both of you, if you could, to speak to what are your suggestions for how we can increase pathways um, within the environmental field, but also how do, can we continue to do and improve the job that we're doing in engaging our communities in transformational ways? Uh, so I think for, for me is as, as someone who works at the national level and international level, I get to I get to travel around to the country and figure out how we can support our regional and local partners. Uh, and I, I'm starting to see a lot of a um, lot of positive uh, programs out there that are either doing conservation steward programs, internship programs, entry pathway programs. 
And I think the opportunity for us as a movement is to start thinking not only about the, that pathway, but to start thinking about the retention of those individuals within that space. And so oftentimes, so Green 2.0 and, and some of my research and, and, and talking to some of the colleagues that we've seen the, the study, those numbers didn't shift much, but if you look at the numbers of hires for those green, big green NGOs, they actually hired a lot of people of color, a lot of di di diversity markers, but they couldn't hold on to them. And that, that speaks to a broader uh, system of inclusion, of, of culture within that, that, those groups to talk about what, what does it mean to actually be an organization that not only uh, broadcast uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and justice, but actually practices, uh, pr puts it into practice through their policies, their HR, mm -hmm. their, their uh, systematic um, uh, support of these individuals to succeed within these organizations, where oftentimes um, those same organizations have been built by individuals who knowingly or unknowingly were, were um, were meaning to keep those individuals out of the, that narrative and that building of the organization. And so I think that's, that's next, uh, front, uh, next uh, horizon for us uh, to, to look at how do we actually retain a lot of good talent that's already out there and, and how do we prevent this burnout and, and losing of talent from, for, our, for our movement. So I think um, one of the strategies I use, I talked about the Green Leadership Trust, those are board members of color across big green organizations. And in our work as the invisible folks who are fiduciaries to organizations, one of the conversations we had is, what could we possibly do for this work if we mirror the same practices? What does it mean to only have the largest green groups in our membership? What is that doing for the way the work actually happens? So we had to have an internal conversation about our own nonsense and about placeholding and gatekeeping and whether or not we are as open as we were demanding other people to be. And what came as a result of that was the opening up of our membership. So if you're on a local green team or a board that serves just your street but it's focused on the environment, you have just as much right to be in the space as if, it, if there's a picture of some charismatic megafauna on a flag and that's, how you, that's how you relate to the work. And so we started in our own space and figured out how to flatten the way that we relate to one another and simultaneously started asking organizations in the environment to do the same. So I think some of that work about placemaking, because you can hire lots of really great, brilliant people, but as you pointed out, if you don't create a space where they can thrive, a culture they relate to, or a place where they can be systematically, automatically included and mentored by someone with power so that they can see what that looks like, try some of it on and gain some of it, we are failing to do the work because part of looking at a good fit for a good candidate has to be whether they'll be able to survive, not whether we continue to create amazing unicorns that go off to a field where there isn't enough protein and die. So, and, that, and let me know if I lost you anywhere or there, but I, because I think about this a lot yeah. as someone who's connected to a lot of folks who are thinking about environmental work, not just caring about the environment, but being able to build your life around the thing you care about and support your family. So it's really important for us to just be thinking about the conditions and not just the end goal or the markers. So for my money, I care about equity and inclusion and diversity is a lot less interesting. So we have a, a question from the audience. Um, so, and you each kind of spoke on this a little bit during your presentations, but speaking to some of the challenges that you've experienced as people of color in the environmental field, um, particularly the question spoke to, um, you know, when people of color potentially are out, you know, doing outdoorsy activities, whether it's hiking, camping, um, birding, and people are being asked, well, what are you doing there? Um, why are you here? Um, have you had similar experiences? Um, and what should, what is the appropriate response in those situations? <laughs> oh, man. Um. The PG response? <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, it, it's it's heartbreaking. I I, I gotta say, um, part of part of my early career was working with a great program out, outside of LA called Outward Bound Adventures, uh, that dedicated itself to taking out uh, 
you know, first time offenders, uh, foster, uh, youth, um, youth in the foster care system, um, uh, the young leaders who, like me, were not the ones to raise their hand and volunteer for a trip, but that needed the trip to, to engage with those spaces. And more often than not, you, you got the looks, you got, you got the questions, um, and I mean, I got too many stories to, to share about that. But I think it, for me, it was always about sitting down and analyzing those, those moments with the leaders themselves and asking, asking how those, why the, the, that was happening and how it could change. Um, and and that's, that's what I think is, is really, um, to some individuals, not to everybody, is, is scary, especially to the individuals in power who feel like they own that space and that narrative of this is the conservation movement and there's only one particular lens to look at that movement with. Uh, and the, the challenge to that is that, no, actually, there's, it's a very eclectic, uh, it's very diverse, uh, and it's very different. And if, if so what if a kid, a, a young leader is hiking through the park with his speaker on listening to rap? Um, and what if uh, a teenager is, is, is doing a live stream while he's doing a hike? Like what are, what are the opportunities there for us to engage those individuals in that narrative and really um, bestow that legacy of the land to, to those to that generation that, that's coming ahead. Um, and I think those, those are bigger questions. And so uh, I think for me, it's, it's one about um, owning that space for ourselves and really being, being set in that and rooted in that and knowing that each one of us um, has an inherent, a public inheritance of those public lands, whether they are right outside of your backyard or they are this great wilderness out there. Uh, it, to be able to own that. And so I think one of the powerful things that my dad ever said to me was, you know, he took us to this park and, and we were eight, 10 years old. And, um, and he started asking us to pick up trash in this park. And me being a, a kid, why would I pick up trash? This is a park. Um, and my dad's response was, this is your park. This is, this is our park, this is our family's park. And I, I know maybe he was joking, uh, or maybe not, and maybe he has some wisdom in, in that. Um, but, but that really impacted me in, in, in retrospect and really feeling, really being able to go back to that park and point to that park and say to my friends, that is our park. That is the park that we own. And truth be told that, that if, if every community could look at those public land spaces and say, this is our park, this is our ownership, and learn uh, and be able to share that space, I, th I think um, we can do some powerful stuff by leveraging that ownership to uh, extending it to democracy, to civil um, discourse, to civil, um, to, and to policy changes that can happen beyond just what a park means to a community. Um, I can say with all earnestness that my survival tactic has been not staying in any organization long enough to be crushed by it. So I've moved every three years for 21 years doing environmental work before I met my husband specifically for that reason, because the culture was not a fit, because after a while the same thing I was hired for would potentially, would, could, could become a thing that becomes really uncomfortable and I either have to face isolation or move on. So being really honest with myself about what I came for, which was a specific set of skills that I would build at each place, it's why there are not, I don't have 27 colleagues because so many folks left. They got tired of being isolated in the thing that they thought was gonna be their dream and walked away from it. And so now that we've all decided to collectively be awake and I get phone calls going, how many unicorns do you know? We need to stack them up and put them in these jobs so that we can move up on that list. Uh, I said, well, some of them went off to become bakers because with their incredible degrees, they got tired of being told that they have to do justice work if they just wanna do technical assistance. They get tired of being steered into pockets of work that serve political purposes instead of what they wanna do. And part of how I learned this was my very first internship um, 
in the place that is now Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C. Back when it was a really cool post office building and library. I love that place. I love being in the attic of that place in one of the smallest environmental um, and federal agencies that mostly did federal education of on government to government relations and was sort of a one stop shop for tribes to figure out who in the gov U.S. government they needed to deal with on an issue. And in my time, I had an internship. And at the end of the internship, it was a picnic. And we all got lined up as, you know, bright, shiny interns. We're going to have a picnic. Uh, Bill, you're going to bring the coleslaw. Jim, you're going to bring the um, hacky sack, because you always got to have a hacky sack. They're environmentalists. If you're not burning something, boiling things, or playing hacky sack, you might not be an environmentalist. There you go. And, and the person looked at me and said, tomorrow, you bring the fried chicken. And I said, I've been a vegetarian for 20 years. I wouldn't even know where to get the fried chicken. And before I could finish saying that, I thought to myself, well, how am I going to deal with this? Am I going to make this person feel comfortable? Uh, how are we going to do this? Because I already feel violated, and I'm not sure if I should just make everybody feel that way. And I decided to say, OK, do you think that when I go to the ATM, instead of money, fried chicken comes out? So we went all the way there. And he said, tomorrow, you don't have to bring anything. I'm really sorry about that. You just come to the, you, I'm so sorry. And like, we never talked again for the entirety of my internship or really, and I've seen him at conferences, and to this day, he knows there's something that, for some reason, he shouldn't talk to me <laughs> as I've aged some 20 years. But like, he's just like, I know I can't talk to this person. And we've never had a conversation about the fact that he made an assumption that humiliated me in front of a room full of people who had been my peers up to that moment. And the, even though he tried to take it back, we didn't discuss it. And so I think that was sort of the first place where I learned I can only be in this space for so long. So having been in this work for two decades and been at multiple levels of it, I noticed that it's not just a thing that happens to a bright, shiny person who wants to do good. It's about a culture that does this to everybody. And there are real issues with what that means to everybody. So happy to, to like spend time later talking about that. But I, do, I think for the changes that we've made until we attempt to change the culture, we can you know, create a lot of programs, but we, but we really do need to focus on how we relate to one another to get to a better place. Thank you. Sure. Um, so we have time for one more question. Um, and there's been some questions that have been produced from the audience too that speak to this about success. Um, so first and foremost is, what does success look like for this integration of this work um, within our personal lives, within our professional lives? Um, and then lastly, we talked this evening about the empowerment that we want our audience to speak to moving forward. Um, what are some of those, you know, one or two tips each um, that you can provide for people to take that next step? You're first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, oh, you know. So I'll, I'll share with, uh, with you what, I think it's both the call to action and this and the skill development in, in it of itself. And my my vision for what success means for us tonight here is that you feel empowered and confident enough to want to lean into this conversation and have the courage to um, go out and learn more about it and build the skill set. Uh, build the skill set that allows you to really hone in your listening skill set more than anything else. So that at some point you can show up in any community, uh, and maybe it's your own neighbors, and be able to knock on your neighbor's door, a couple doors down all across, and really sit down and have an honest and frank conversation about what matters to your community. What matters to your community, and that skill set, that 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 piece of being able to just go beyond the um, the salutation uh, of hey, how you doing? How's the mail? Like, you know, uh, how are the holidays? But being able to sit down with your neighbors and really talk about what can we do with it within our community that does, that could really make an impact for us. Um, and beyond that, also extend to yourself, well, what, what about our community could extend to other communities and support their vision and, and things like that. And for me, it's become very, very apparent. So I, I I, I grew up in LA, I um, always thought I was gonna be the kid who never left LA, that if I ever got, got a big job and made, made a couple of different fig more figures than I was making then, 
that I would get myself a ghetto mansion and like, you know, do this thing and have parties 24 seven. I was never gonna leave South Central LA and then I met my wife uh, and she was a park ranger at Grand Teton uh, National Park at the time. So I moved to Jackson Hole, an another liberal kind of place. A different ghetto mansion. A different ghetto <laughs> mansion. <laughs> yeah, a different yeah, set. Different. And then from there, she got named to Department of Interior here in DC. So we moved to DC and then we moved back to LA for her to be in Santa Monica. There's a point to this. And now we are in Springfield, Illinois, in the middle of America. And it's been a, 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 a tremendous awakening to me to go from these uh, very uh, left-leaning communities to where I could always find a community w that, that would agree with my own political views to now have to share space um, and, and resources with a community does not, that does not agree with my own political views. So my neighbors have Trump stickers all over their cars. Um, they fly a Confederate flag. But I re after having conversations with them, I really feel that they are good people. And so it's, it's been challenging for me to recognize where our shared commonality in that space can be. Um, and and it's, it's taking all of the skill sets that I've built over the last 18 years to really, really have the patience and, and the love and, and the, 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 um, the I don't know what else to, to try to make that work. Um, and so, it, you know, I, I, and I, I would imagine that Baltimore is similar to, to that, but beyond Baltimore, there's, there's and, and I know because I've driven into deep, the deep Bal Maryland state, um, that there is communities out there that don't agree with, with a lot of our own political views that I would assume most, most of this room shares. Uh, and, but but that's, that's an awakening, and I think that, that speaks to the, to, to the polarizing of, of our country at this point. Um, and there, there needs, there, that's the biggest challenge for us as a movement, as a country, and as a people to, to really find that common ground and that shared, um, shared accountability and responsibility for all of us. So I think I define success differently than I did 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, I would have defined success as being a rocket, and you know, 20 plus years later, I define it as building rockets. So I, my greatest joy is making a connection that helps someone else stay in the work a little longer. Mm. Uh, building a relationship in a space where that has really been hostile and figuring out why do they do that. Um, it goes to what you said. I spent a lot of time traveling around the country trying to be you know, the best escape artist, environmentalist you've ever seen. Um, and really trying to figure out what is it that people want. And the thing I've found is that people don't want anything different. They just think they have to do things that we might find repulsive to get it. And if we could figure out what that thing is that they want, we can work on how we might get that and everybody live. So for, so for me, I think really being excited about this time when there are so many bright people with so many different ideas and creativity and interests and capacities that I have not even thought of and figuring out how we can keep them in community and stay in relationship together so that the things that get built magnify. So for me, um, just figuring out how to connect everyone that I'm meeting and the people that I'm learning about to the big question of what we are doing here and how we can protect our species. Um, just being in conversation with folks around that is a success to me and setting, setting up the next 20 years so that I can watch some other people be really successful as a result of this continuing intervention of staying in the work. Well, thank you. Um, and I just want to ever give everyone um, a chance to give a round of applause to our panelists. And also thank you to all of you um, for, again, taking the time to come out this evening for this important discussion. Thank you for what you already have done. And thank you for what you will continue to do. 
to ensure a diverse, equitable, inclusive, and just conservation field moving forward. Just some uh, last minute housekeeping information um, about the National Aquarium. Future events for the Marjorie Lynn Bang Lecture Series are in the works and when those are posted, um, those dates will be found on the webpage. Please visit aqua.org slash lecture for more information about the series and to watch past lectures. If you're on our email list, you'll receive information about future lectures as soon as it's available. You can also visit aqua.org to join our email list and find information about future lectures and events. And lastly, just wanting to share a couple of upcoming events. Um, so on March 26, the Greater Baltimore Wilderness Coalition, of which the National Aquarium is a partner of, will be hosting their Nature City Forum, a conversation um, about a holistic approach to conservation involving health, justice, environmental education, um, and many other topics. Um, so please do check for that moving forward. And then also in April, um, April 26th through April 29th, the National Aquarium is working with several partners in Baltimore City for the City Nature Challenge. Um, so an opportunity to engage those communities around us um, to really understand the biodiversity of life that's here in Baltimore City. Um, and with that, I just again want to say thank you again and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>